Tonight on NJTV News, the Attorney General threatens sanctuary cities to comply with immigration law. Today, some cities push back. How and why Tom MacArthur was the only New Jersey congressman to support the failed bill to repeal and replace Obamacare. Back in action after a year, see which state agency finally holds a public meeting. We're now using our toes to count the latest credit downgrade for the Garden State. And one New Jersey county recognized nationally for its work on a nagging issue. Those stories and more next on NGTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Hill. Mary Alice Williams is off today. Sanctuary cities have been warned to comply with the federal immigration law as the Trump administration keeps tabs on who's defying that law. Today, leaders in some of those cities responded and pointed to the impact of tough talk on immigration. David Cruz reports. The administration has pivoted from its health care debacle and turned to another favorite issue, immigration enforcement, specifically targeting so-called sanctuary cities, those places that have said they will not cooperate with federal immigration officers when it comes to unauthorized immigrants. This week, Attorney General Jeff Sessions drew a line in the sand. Such policies cannot continue. They make our nation less safe by putting dangerous criminals back on the streets. Sessions pointed to the recent release of the Declined Detainer Outcome Report from the Department of Homeland Security, which showed more than 200 instances of jurisdictions refusing to honor immigration and customs enforcement detainer requests. Sessions said sanctuary city policies endanger the very people they're intended to protect. Today, I'm urging states and local jurisdictions to comply with these federal laws, including 8 U.S.C. Section 1373. Moreover, the Department of Justice will require that jurisdictions seeking or applying for Department of Justice grants to certify compliance with 1373 as a condition of receiving those awards. U.S.C. Section 1373 requires local jurisdictions to cooperate with ICE requests for information on the immigration status of any individuals. Sessions said the administration will, quote, claw back funding for any jurisdiction that's getting DOJ money currently, and said they will withhold grants, terminate grants, and render jurisdictions ineligible for future grants if they don't comply. The mayor of the state's largest city was defiant. Ras Baraka called the policy, quote, both illegal and unconstitutional, and said Newark will join other sanctuary cities to take legal action against this misguided policy. In North Hudson County, where the majority of the population is made up of immigrants, West New York Mayor Felix Roque was less outwardly defiant, but no less opposed to the policy. I took an oath, and the oath was to protect the residents of West New York, and they are the same as us. Uh, they're, you know, human beings just like us. It doesn't matter to me color, creed, or religion. I'm here to protect them, and that's what I took an oath to do, and I am going to protect them. Meeting in Washington with families of recently deported immigrants, New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez said he's introducing legislation to fight the administration's policy. The usually reserved senator moved to tears this morning. When I listen to the president speak, he talks about bad hombres. Well, certainly their father, Rose's husband, they're not bad hombres. Meanwhile, Governor Christie showed none of that emotion. If they engage in voluntary conduct, then they think it's important enough for their taxpayers to pick up the tab. It's their call. Mayor Phillip, Mayor Baraka, have at it. Jersey City Mayor Steve Phillip, whose city just got almost $2 million in federal funds to hire new cops, had no comment today. It's unclear when the Trump administration would start to claw back funds, but a legal challenge is sure to follow its first attempt. In Jersey City, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. Building a defense to beat beach erosion. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Berkeley Township in Ocean County. 
volunteers are lining the Jersey Shore with spades in one hand and wisps of grass in the other. On Island Beach State Park, they dig six to eight inches into the nature-made sand dunes to plant the grass. In other spots along Jersey's long coast, they do it in man-made dunes. A University of Pennsylvania doctoral student has studied the effect of dune grass and determined it preserves the dunes. How does it work? As the grass grows, its roots form a weave and hold the dunes together. It's a natural protection against storms and other ways beaches can erode. Next to PPAC, and just because a disability robs you of speaking doesn't mean you can't have a voice. That's one of the lessons and goals of the statewide Stages Festival. It's a month-long event for actors with disabilities to express themselves. Thaney Medical and Education Center says folks often first notice the disabilities of its residents, but Stages allows those residents to show what they can do, what they're capable of doing by giving them access to the arts, and they can enjoy it with dignity and independence. Those are big goals of the organizers and the state. Finally, to Carney, envision the day when you can walk or bike for hundreds of miles. In five years, the $480 million Whitpen Bridge over the Hackensack River should be completed, connecting Kearney and Jersey City. It's part of a bigger plan to have walking and biking trails for 3,000 miles, all the way from Florida to Maine. The Bike and Walk Coalition says several other connections need to be planned and made, eventually linking many trails and even Newark to Jersey City. Organizers hope the trails will connect with light rail stations as well and local parks to give folks access to walking and biking free of cars and free of trucks. And that's our Garden State Express for this March 28th, 2017. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Governor Christie has launched an unflinching attack on Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. It started with his budget address last month and continued with his Ask the Governor radio show. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron joins us with the story. Chris Christie really gave it to Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey last night. The governor wants to tap Horizon's surplus for $300 million to bolster state spending on opioid addiction as part of the 2018 budget. Christie told Eric Scott of 101.5 last night, legislation on that is coming. I find it hard to believe that Democratic legislators are going to say no to the idea that a company like Horizon, which is a nonprofit set up for the benefit of the people of New Jersey, that they won't take their excess profits, just a piece of their excess profits, and use them to help poor people who are drug addicted. I can't believe that Democrats won't support that, especially when Horizon is paying millions of dollars to their executives and their lobbyists. I mean, if they say they don't have the money, then I'd like them tonight to reveal what they pay their lobbyists. What do they pay the CEO? Isn't there lobbyist Gibbons that's run by your former? I don't know. Well, listen, that's probably one of them. That's fine yeah. by me. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I don't care who who their lobbyists are. They also have a whole team of internal lobbyists. Of internal, yeah. Right? And the CEO and the COO and the CFO, what are they making at a nonprofit? What are they making at a nonprofit that they can afford to do that, but they can't afford to take excess profit? And that's what this is. It's excess profit. And put some of it towards their mission. Because remember, Obamacare took away their mission. Their mission was to be the insurer of last resort mm -hmm. in New Jersey. That's no longer necessary because we have Obamacare. It continued like this for five minutes and thus qualifies as a Christie rant. And like his rants, it picked up intensity. The governor said Horizon has made, quote, tons of money off of Medicaid thanks to Obamacare. And that's taxpayer money, public money. What I want to call on them tonight to do is to release the salaries, the current salaries, with all the other stuff, deferred compensation, pension payments, bonuses, all the other stuff, how much they paying their CEO, how much they paying their COO, how much are they paying their CFO, how much are they paying their lobbyists, both in-house and outside, to fight 
helping the drug addicted poor with excess profits. Well, I'm, you know, like I'm, saying, I'm not very sympathetic to this, and I'm a Republican who supports business in the state and has been the most business friendly governor in two decades. But you know what? They're a nonprofit that's supposed to be working for the benefit of the people of this state. They're making a fortune off of Medicaid, and now they're big time, well connected lobbyists being paid a fortune want to stop the drug addicted poor from being helped. Shame on them. Shame on them. Horizon spokesperson Kevin McCardle sent us a statement that reads in part, Horizon is always looking to partner, but no amount of bullying or posturing will change the fact that the governor's proposal is a massive tax hike on policyholders. McCardle told us by phone that Horizon's surplus is $2.4 billion, but its profit last year was just $84 million, and all of the executive salaries are on file at the Department of Banking and Insurance in Trenton, so Christie can presumably get those with a phone call. And if the governor needs $300 million, McArdle added, why did he cut the sales tax last year? Michael? Thanks, Michael. If it rained only when the state election law enforcement commission met, we'd have a drought of epic proportions. It's raining today, and elect, as it's called, held its first meeting in 54 weeks. Brenda Flanagan reports. New Jersey's so-called election watchdogs back on track and none too soon as the state barrels toward campaigns for the governor's office and all 120 legislative seats, the Election Law Enforcement Commission, or ELEC, finally convened a quorum today. First task, approve the minutes from a year ago. Next, we're going to be uh, handling the approval of the public session minutes of March 15th, 2016. Hard even to say. I uh, almost forgot about those minutes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Amusing for ELEC's executive director, Jeff Brindle, but vacancies on the four-member commission kept it sidelined for months until Governor Christie nominated replacements. Today, Eric Jaso and Stephen Holden joined Chairman Ron DeFilippis, while Christie's final candidate, Marguerite Simon, looked on. She's awaiting Senate confirmation. They couldn't do the final official business that we require of the Election Law Enforcement Commission and that is enforcement. Former Rutgers Eagleton director Ingrid Reed says ELEC enforces campaign finance laws like the complaint it filed charging Essex County Executive Joe DiVincenzo with allegedly misspending tens of thousands of campaign dollars on items like clothing and trips. That case is now in court. Meanwhile, ELEC staff kept investigating other cases, but without a quorum. You couldn't get to that end point of, of fining people. So, in effect, you were neuterized. You could collect a lot of numbers, and uh, but then you couldn't hold people responsible. ELEC distributes public matching campaign funds, and today it also awarded the rights to sponsor four gubernatorial primary debates. NJTV News, in concert with NJ Spotlight, and Stockton University will each host a Republican and a Democratic debate, dates to be determined. We're in the uh, Pinelands of South Jersey, and that's what we actually do offer you, access for South Jersey people to be able to come and hear a debate. The idea is for this to be not only broadcast live um, in prime time, uh, but also to be streamed on the web. ELEC urged both groups to consider sharing their live stream of the debates. I think that's a whole new way of sort of treating these debates, so I think it, it's a wonderful news for us. New Jersey's Senate will meet in May when it's expected to confirm the fourth and last ELEC Commission candidate just in time for New Jersey's June primary. In Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Rhonda Schaffler is standing by with a look at today's business news. Rhonda, a warning from a major insurance company. That's right, Michael. Aetna is notifying policyholders in the state that patients may have to pay a lot more to use RWJ Barnabas Health Facilities unless its contract talks improve soon with the hospital network. The two-year contract between the state's largest hospital network and Aetna expires in late April. Edna says RWJ Barnabas, which is an underwriter of NJTV News, is asking for significant rate increases, and the two sides disagree over reimbursement rates. But a spokesperson for the hospital chain says RWJ Barnabas expects a new contract will be reached before the current one expires. 
New Jersey's underfunded pension system is a big problem, and it is behind the latest credit downgrade for the state's debt. The action by Moody's Investors Service marks the 11th time the state's credit rating has been lowered under Governor Christie's tenure. Moody says its downgrade reflects the negative impact from the pension shortfall and said New Jersey's credit picture will only worsen due to those unfunded liabilities. But Moody's did say the state's near-term outlook is stable, citing solid economic performance. In his state budget address last month, the governor called for using lottery proceeds to help fund the pension system. One of the biggest international credit card frauds ever occurred right here in New Jersey, according to federal prosecutors. Two owners of a Jersey City jewelry store were sentenced Monday in connection with the scheme in which they fabricated more than 7,000 false identities to obtain tens of thousands of credit cards. Officials say the men borrowed or spent as much as they could without repaying the debts, causing more than $200 million in losses to businesses and financial institutions. Big changes for the energy industry as President Trump signed an executive order that rolls back energy policies put in place by President Obama, such as regulations on fracking and limits on power plant emissions. Trump says the move will create new jobs. Consumer confidence has risen to a 16-year high. That propelled a big rally on Wall Street. The Dow soared 150 points. The Nasdaq and S&P also rose sharply. And those are our top business stories for this Tuesday. Congressman Tom MacArthur, a Republican from South Jersey, was the only New Jersey House member to say he would support the American Health Care Act. Of course, the vote never happened because of too much opposition. Congressman MacArthur joins us from Washington by Skype. Congressman, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my pleasure, Michael. Hello. But why did you support the American Health Care Act? And we ask that because we know back in January you voted against the budget resolution that would have set this whole thing in process. Well, I did vote no. I was one of only nine at that time. And I voted no because I thought we were moving too fast. And I, I thought it was important to get this right, uh, not just uh, quick. But every one of us is faced with a, a challenge. When things don't go our way, do we, do we fold up our arms and obstruct or do we try to be constructive? And, and that's what I was faced with. And I decided to try to be constructive, to try to make this bill uh, better. And, uh, and I worked over the past weeks with, uh, the, with the president, with the vice president, the speaker, different uh, members of my own party. And we made really dramatic improvements to the bill uh, in the last two weeks. And, uh, you know, in total, adding $165 billion for the most needy. And, I, you know, it's easy to roll your eyes with dollars and, and, uh, and forget the point. This is direct help to the American people that most needed it. Congressman, some were upset about a projected loss of health insurance for 24 million people by 2026, and this is according to the Congressional Budget Office. But why do you think this legislation did not come to a vote? Well, Michael, there's two questions there. The first is about people losing insurance, and that was of great concern to me. And I looked at the Congressional Budget Office score, the CBO score, and they have a difficult challenge. They're trying to figure out what might happen and what it might do to the system. And they concluded that when there was no individual mandate requiring people to buy insurance, that tens of millions wouldn't buy it. Uh, that, to me, is different than us taking it away from people. And I tried and, and, I, and successfully worked to make sure that every American would have the ability to buy health insurance. And, and I'll just give you one example. Today, under the Affordable Care Act, there are 23 million people who get zero benefit. They pay a penalty or a tax for not being insured, or they get a waiver. There's 12 and a half million people who get a waiver. And then some millions just ignore the, the law altogether. Every single one of them, without exception, would be getting a, 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 a federal money under our bill to go out and either put that money into an HSA or to buy insurance, every one of them would be better off. 
Uh, Congressman, we have a minute left. I want to ask you what's next, but first I want to ask you, this is a quote from your colleague in the House, Congressman Bill Pascrell, who said to get along, he says, I get along with uh, Congressman MacArthur, but this is a dumb thing he's doing, your support for this legislation. He's making himself more vulnerable. How do you respond to that? Well, look, I love Bill Pascrell. He's, uh, he's a good man, and I work closely with him. Uh, if you look at legislation based on whether it makes you personally more vulnerable, I think that's a mistake. Now, this isn't about politics. This isn't about a political calculation. This is about just doing what we said we would do. And I wish the health care system weren't falling apart, but it is. And millions of people are being hurt. They're having trouble getting insurance. They're paying too much. And I came here not to decorate a chair, but to try to be uh, somebody who makes a difference. And that's that's my focus. If it makes me more vulnerable, then so be it. But I, I have to do what I believe I can do. I, uh, I spent a lifetime in business. I have a different perspective about what might be helpful. And, uh, and I know what it's like to be on the bottom end of very difficult medical issues. And I am doing my best to try to help the American people have a health, a health care system that, uh, that doesn't let them down. Uh, Congressman, House Speaker Ryan says that you're still working on this bill. You're involved in that uh, negotiation to try to fine-tune this legislation? I don't think it's dead. We, we didn't vote last week. That was a self-imposed deadline. Leadership decided that they wanted to do it that day on the seventh anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. That date was never uh, that big an issue to me. I think over the coming weeks, uh, hopefully, we can get to a place where enough uh, members of Congress believe we've gotten the right approach to get it to get it passed. If we don't, uh, people are going to continue to get hurt. And, uh, and and again, I know there are people listening who have been helped by the Affordable Care Act. And those are the ones I think that are the most scared. I'm asking them to try to give us a chance and really try to get past all the noise and hear what this bill really does, because we're, we're trying to uh, transition them to a place where they get they get a similar amount of help and they have more flexibility. We'll be watching Congressman Tom MacArthur joining us from Washington by Skype. Thank you, Congressman. Okay, Michael, thank you. One of the wealthiest counties in the state declares it no longer has chronic homelessness. Bergen County says it's the first in the nation to do so. It's addressing a stubborn issue as it helps people chasing the dream. Aaron Delmore has the story. In Bergen County, a first in the nation. The community is being hailed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development for ending chronic homelessness. We triaged our by name list one person at a time until we had no one left on that list. And then we started a new list so that we could house people before anyone could age into chronic homelessness again. It's the term the U.S. government uses to describe long-term homelessness among people with disabilities and other complex needs. Officials said Tuesday around a quarter of Bergen County's thousand plus homeless residents were considered chronically homeless. Not only is this an accomplishment for this particular community, but this is a proof point for us in the federal government and across the nation for our partners at Community Solutions, for our partners at other federal agencies. It's the proof point to show that we can actually end chronic homelessness across this country. Chronic homelessness is on the decline nationwide. The current population is around three quarters of what it was in 2010. But Bergen County, the site of the greatest gains, is also one of the wealthiest communities in the state, leading some to ask how its success can be replicated. So many cities across our country are struggling to end chronic homelessness, but people who need shelter the most cannot get into them because of alcohol or drugs or mental illness, because of behavioral challenges. We made sure that all of those people that before couldn't get into shelter, not only could get into shelter, but were prioritized for shelter and prioritized for housing. Several hundred people use this shelter over the course of a year. Advocates say consolidating resources saves taxpayer money. We eliminated all the temporary substandard shelters and consolidated into this beautiful building that offers shelter, nourishment, health and human services, and access to permanent housing to anyone that needs it. Our fellow human beings, especially the ones who have fallen on hard times, deserve our compassion and our support.
and they deserve a chance to overcome the circumstances that have led to their homelessness. Bergen County made headlines when it announced an end to veteran homelessness last August. With today's announcement on ending chronic homelessness, officials say they're looking forward to the next goal. That's reducing homelessness overall in Bergen County. In the newsroom, I'm Erin Delmore, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, prosecutors are seeking three-year sentences for Bridget Kelly and Bill Baroni's roles in Bridgegate. They're each hoping for probation. A federal judge, of course, will decide. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Michael Hill. Thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. My husband and I spent more than 30 years in the public schools. We're retired, but we like to stay involved. Do you think he's going to learn to fly? We're just as busy now as in our teaching days. The same goes for a lot of the retired educators we know. Let me see you all flap your wings like your penguins learning to fly. Teaching is all about building relationships, and that never goes away. Because once a teacher, always a teacher. We're Ed and Miriam, and we are proud to be New Jersey educators.